Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, next presenter is Cosimo Checky, and he's going to talk to you about Endless OS. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, it's really good to be here. Um, Karlsruhe is a really awesome city. So today I'm going to be talking about Endless OS. Uh, this is going to be a technical, fairly technical talk. So be prepared, uh, be, <laughs> beware. <laughs> um, all right, so a couple of words on myself. I've been involved uh, with GNOME since 2007. I uh, lead the Endless OS team um, and we're based in San Francisco. That's where I live. Uh, if you happen to be around, uh, Come and say hi. Um, so what is Endless? Um, we began by selling hardware. Uh, some of you may remember uh, we even had a raffle uh, last year's squad. We gave away a couple of our uh, computers that we make. Um, in reality, um, you know, we are not really a hardware company. Uh, we are a software company. Uh, we want uh, as many people as possible to use our software. Uh, and that's why we made uh, Endless OS available for download recently. So if you go to our website, which is endlessm.com, you will be able to download um, a version of our operating system, even though it doesn't have, it's a little old, it doesn't have yet all the features that I'm going to be talking about today, uh, you will find a new version very soon that has all the cool stuff. Um, so um, I keep looking here because I didn't manage to make the two screens mirror, so sorry about that. Uh, so what is Endless OS? It is an operating system based on GNOME. And I like to think, so some of you may have been around long enough to remember the GNOME OS initiative. It was like, you know, a little bit like of um, a vague idea to make um, really like an operating system based on GNOME. And I like to think personally that a lot of those ideas actually uh, happened uh, in Endless OS. Um, so as far as I know, it's one of the closest things to some of those ideas uh, that actually exist. Um, the stack that we're based on is a fairly modern but fairly standard uh, Linux uh, stack. So we have things like systemd, we have you know U power, U disks, all the daemons, a network manager, pulse audio, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Basically everything that Leonard wrote. Uh, <laughs> Leonard to us. Um, it is also, and the OS is also a Linux distribution based on uh, Debian. So uh, we used to use Ubuntu, uh, Ubuntu source packages um, as the base of our OS uh, for, for a while. That was for a number of reasons, uh, mostly because when we started, Ubuntu had a lot better ARM support than Debian. Um, then that changed. Uh, now we are actually uh, mostly based on a Debian stable, Debian Jesse, except for a few toolchain packages that are really hard to migrate that we still take from Ubuntu. Um, and uh, uh, more bleeding edge packages, so newer packages, and the GNOME stack we take from Debian Unstable. Um, at the same time, we are not a Linux distribution in traditional sense, so it's a little confusing. Um, I, um, this is a little digression, I like to think that um, what a distribution is and like the relationship between a distribution and an operating system kind of evolved over time. Uh, you know, a decade ago it was the era of distribution in the sense that they all looked uh, fairly similar. Like, you know, they all shipped like different package systems, different like, you know, very technical differences, but the user experience was similar. Um, that was mostly because it was difficult to put together uh, an operating system. Like all, it, it, it was really hard to put together all the tools to really make an OS. Over time, I think the differences between distros shifted more on the user experience itself, and you st we started seeing things like you know elementary OS or uh, Mint and things like that that really. You know, instead of being a different distro, maybe they're all based on Ubuntu, but instead of being a different distro, they're really a different user experience. So I like to think of them as uh, different operating systems. So Endless is very much in that camp. Um, 
You know, we, we are, you know, that it's called endless OS for a reason. Um, one very important thing, we don't make packages available to end users. So as you will see uh, during the presentation, we use packages for many, many things in endless, but they're not directly exposed to users. We use uh, one OS3, I'll talk about uh, that a little bit later, but users don't have control over the OS, how that is put together. It's very similar to um, what you have on Android or iOS or things like that, where basically the OS is a, a, an image um, and all the things that you install on top you get from a store or something like that. So there's no app to, uh, to, be, to be as precise. So the OS is a single, read-only, immutable OS3. Uh, we use, of course, OS3 as, uh, as the distribution mechanism for the OS bits and also for other things, um, as you will see later. Um, the OS go only goes forward in this sense. So you, know, you can update from version 1 to version 2 to version 3. You cannot change and add like version 1 and something else, or version 2 or something else. And it goes forward automatically. So we actually download updates whenever they're available. Uh, we deploy the new OS3 um, as soon as the updates are downloaded. And then when that is ready, uh, we show the user a notification. Hey, do you want to restart now? Um, you know, a new version of the OS has been installed. Um, we can get away with this because we test very well uh, the versions that go out. So basically, when a user presses the restart button, uh, they, they don't reboot to a broken system, hopefully. <laughs> um, so how automatic this operation is is actually configurable. And we have a little process that um, manages all of this. It's called EOS Updater. You can find it on our GitHub. Um, it may be interesting at some point to have something very much like EOS Updater, which is basically a daemon that talks to the OS3 daemon and offers a Dbus interface for things like Control Center or potentially, I don't know, GNOME software to use it. Um, I know that GNOME software these days has also an OS3 plugin that uh, manages OS3 updates to a certain extent. I don't know how, um, how featureful that is, uh, how well it works. Um, if some of you are interested in seeing something like this in GNOME, I was thinking maybe useful for GNOME Continuous as well. Uh, uh, talk to me, basically. And um, another thing that it does, it disables this automatic downloading when it detects that you're on a meter connection or a mobile data plan or something like that, because we don't want people to pay hundreds of dollars downloading gigabytes in that case. Um, so that's for DOS. That's how we deploy the operating system. Everything that goes on top of the OS uh, is uh, basically distributed through an application store, like I was saying before. And we used to have our own system to manage all of this. So we used to have our own way of creating bundles. Uh, we used to have our own app store. Uh, we are actually dropping. So that's what you find if you download right now an endless image uh, from a website. Uh, but we dropped all of this <laughs> just recently in uh, in our new upcoming release. Uh, we're actually very proud to be, as far as I'm aware, the first production Linux OS to use Flatpak exclusively for applications and uh, GNOME software as well. So we're making... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So we're making a strong bat on the on the technology, of course, and uh, and the community. But you know that's that's why we're here. Uh, we think it's the right way to do it. Uh, we, we we really like we really like the technology, and we're heavily invested in it. Um, and of course, you know our uh, previous in-house system that did this was pretty lame, to be completely honest with you. <laughs> Uh, so we're getting a lot more features. So uh, as I was saying, we use GNOME software as our app store, starting with the new imminent release that should be around end of August. Um, Flatpak bundles are installed system-wide uh, because we want uh, them to be, to be available to all users uh, on the system when they're downloaded. Our users are very... Um, conscious about the use of their bandwidth or actually and or they may be on uh, kind of poor internet connections 
uh, something that I, I didn't mention about Endless at the beginning of the talk for those that uh, don't know uh, us, we are actually not targeting the you know um, Western or uh, North American markets. Uh, so we're kind of like targeting areas uh, that are not as developed. So internet infrastructure uh, is not as good usually, and um, these things are important for our users. Um, we have um, a custom OS into so GNOME software does most of the heavy lifting. There are certain things that are actually um, specific to endless OS and the way that our applications are made. So we have um, a custom plugin that you know you, you can find it in our uh, GitHub GNOME software uh, tree. It's called the EOS plugin that, uh, for instance. Um, since we ship some core applications with OS3, like directly in the core OS, GNOME software doesn't really deal well with that. Uh, it uh, shows them as uh, removable, so you can you see a remove button that you click it, and of course nothing happens because the whole thing is read only. Uh, so we uh, fix that. Uh, uh, thankfully, GNOME software is very flexible in its plugin infrastructure, allows you to do all sorts of things. Uh, so we blacklist certain desktop files. We do a whole bunch of stuff in there um, to make it work better with uh, the OS. Um, other things that we do in GNOME software, we. Um, uh, I wish I had a screenshot here. We do uh, tiles customization is something uh, I, I may I may try to show you later. Um, it's uh, it, it makes the the front page of GNOME software a little more engaging. So the tiles that compose that the, you you'd usually see in the overview have uh, kind of vivid color backgrounds. Uh, this is something that Joachim here made. Uh, it's really nice. Um, we have some custom categories. So um, uh, you know. The uh, target uh, users, again, are uh, kind of different from, I guess, uh, uh, you know, th those that the current XDG menu specification was developed for. Uh, so there's uh, a lot of stuff in the XDG menu specification. There's like, you know, categories very specific for science, for, you know, things that are very technical. Uh, we want to see, you know, Categories like family, uh, family application, like, you know, applications suited for the family or education or things like that. So sometimes we didn't, we couldn't find a, ma a good matching free desktop category for some of our apps. We had to add some new. Um, we're only installing endless runtimes uh, by default today. Uh, so that will change. So if you um, want to install something else, like you want to install a GNOME application that requires a GNOME runtime, uh, you will, for now, have to go through the uh, command line and add the runtime manually there. So everything works, but you know we, we just don't provide it by default. Um, and uh, we make available a lot of third-party applications. However, they are built against the endless runtime for the time being, not against the free desktop runtime. Uh, and of course, we make available a lot of endless applications as well. Um, so what is the endless runtime? It's a little bit of a kitchen sink, to be completely honest with you. Uh, it needs to support all sorts of applications at the moment. Um, as I said, every app that we ship is built against that. Um, starting with the Next, the next version, basically, we plan to move uh, to the GNOME and free desktop runtimes for third-party apps as well. So uh, we plan to ship an image that has multiple runtimes, and we plan to contribute the apps, the manifests for the apps that uh, we want to see in the image to their uh, respective upstream projects. Um, as you're probably hearing, uh, you know, Alex talk. Uh, this is an ongoing effort in the community, uh, so we are, uh, you know, we're helping with that. And if you want to help with, you know, you're curious about the list of apps that we ship, and you want to help, uh, please get in touch with me. So the longer-term vision uh, here is that the endless runtime will only be kept for the in-house endless applications. Um, cool. So. I have to say, GNOME has served our needs for this operating system that we put together extremely well. Like we couldn't be, uh, you know, more pleased uh, with, uh, with, with with what GNOME has uh, has offered us, uh, with how far we've gotten. Uh, most of the, you know, 
GNOME session components like the system settings, settings daemon, uh, mother, uh, core applications, they're all vanilla. So we, you know, we tend to contribute patches upstream and work upstream as much as we can when we need to change something. Um, uh, the initial setup also uh, is, is something very, very useful for us. We have actually a lot of customizations on it. Um, because of the specifics of our user, we had to change text, we had to change some copy. Um, but it got us, you know, it did the heavy lifting for us very, very nicely. Um, Endless Shell is a little bit of a different story at the moment. It has a lot of custom code for a different user experience. And, uh, you know, Mostly, like you know, for 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 sometimes for no good reason, uh, because we were young and brave, we were changing everything uh, at the very beginning. Um, the flip side of that is it kind of demonstrates a concept, um, a possibility at least, of having almost a complete vanilla GNOME um, with just a different shell layer on on on, on the very top, um, and you know. This is something that I, I feel as a project we haven't really uh, explored this direction. Um, and this demonstrates that this is perfectly possible and uh, actually works pretty well in practice. I was thinking, you know, maybe if one wants to develop a shell for a tablet or something like that, it should be perfectly possible. Um, something that, that's just a little detail there, the GDM, we were actually not able to upgrade to the latest 320 uh, because of how it uses Wayland. Um, and uh, I think it launches X in user mode, not as root anymore, and that prevented us from upgrading because the ARM driver, proprietary driver that we have on our ARM machine kind of uh, doesn't deal with that very well. There may be an easy way out through configuration. We haven't really explored this, so uh, maybe if, 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 you, if you know how this works, um, uh, get in touch with me, I, I'd, like, I'd like to know. Um, let me see if I can actually, sh no, the screen doesn't, the mirroring doesn't work, unfortunately. That's partly why I wanted to mirror, to show some of the things that we have in Endless Shell. It looks a lot more like a tablet UI uh, than it looks, uh, than, than GNOME. Uh, the application grid, so the launcher grid, is actually front and center. So the different, that's the kind of the main difference with GNOME Shell. Uh, GNOME Shell, the window picker is front and center. The overview, uh, we have the application picker front and center. So the, uh, you know, the, the, the Windows Witcher, uh, there's a typo there, I should say Windows Witcher, is an explicit operation that you actually have to go and click to find. Um, also, folder management is a lot more prominent. You can drag and drop things in the endless shell, create folders that way, and move things in and out of folders. A little bit how it works on a phone or a mobile OS. Um, we have a taskbar, something different than GNOME. GNOME has a little dock in the overview. We have a taskbar that's always visible, a little more uh, like Windows. And um, we don't have an app menu, which in the past has created a little bit of trouble because GTK uh, did something a little obnoxious, showing like making two title bars. Uh, this is being uh, fixed really nicely, actually, now with the latest GTK uh, and apps that have client-side decorations. You, you get a little nice icon on the uh, left corner, and that works well for us. Notifications is one of the areas that isn't great in Endless Shell, uh, precisely because we have this panel at the bottom and uh, because we haven't upgraded in a long time, it's still based on GNOME Shell 3.8, so we're not getting all the new benefits of the redesigned notification systems that GNOME has. Um, what else? Uh, Chromium is, uh, was our preferred uh, browser of choice. We preferred it to Firefox, uh, mostly for compatibility reasons back then. Um, uh, when we started, Firefox on ARM didn't really exist. Um, we're pretty happy with the choice because it works well. It, it's very compatible with most of the websites. It's actually, you know, it's Google Chrome is, uh, like it or not, the uh, kind of the de facto standard these days. It is a big headache to maintain two video stacks, and uh, that's the price to pay to have 
Chromium, basically. Uh, they don't use GStreamer. There have been efforts in the community uh, from Samsung, I think, to uh, make a GStreamer backend available for Chromium, but that is not merged. It's kind of supported, kind of not. It's a little, it's a little odd. Uh, we don't use it. And uh, we maintain a, a very large Chrome extension that's actually the home page. So the home page is this um, kind of offline portal or uh, it's kind of like AOL back in the days. Like it shows, a, it shows like a, uh, the best of the web, <laughs> kind of a like collection of links, a collection of uh, things that you may find useful, uh, a newspaper, things like that. And it's, uh, it's embedded directly in the browser. And that piece is uh, uh, proprietary for now. Um, so this is what it is. Uh, I want to go one level deeper and talk about how it's made. Uh, first of all, I want to drink some water. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. So how is the whole thing put together? There's, uh, it turns out that there's a lot that goes into making, you know, something that looks that, uh, <laughs> you know, that has all these components inside. I can't say that looks like this because you don't see it. Um, so basically, even though we don't expose packages, I was saying before, the concept of package is not something that the user ever uh, sees or deals with. Everything is put together with packages in the back end. Um, so uh, we use Debian packages, as I was saying before. And um, we have a few different ways to create this Debian source packages. And then a few more ways to go from the source packages to binaries and to flat packs and to OS3s. So not all packages are created equal. So we have a few workflows that I'm going to talk about now. Um, the most basic one is to go from Git to a source package. So we have a lot of stuff that lives in our GitHub. Um, most of it is public. You can go to github.com slash endlessm. Um, that is connected to a continuous integration system that's based on Jenkins. So every time that a Git commit is made, a Jenkins job is triggered. Very similar to how uh, you know, GNOME Continuous does it, uh, kind of. Uh, except just for that one tree. So it goes from Git and through Jenkins basically does, you know, configure, make, make this check, creates a Debian source package. Um, the setup is quite laborious to set up though because you have to, you know, basically make a Debian folder inside your uh, tree and add all the Debian packaging layer. It's not very straightforward so we tend to do it only for projects that are internal or for projects that have a high patch traffic. So for instance, you know, GNOME Control Center or Mother or um, even System D, we have it wired that way because it happens often that we have to backport patches or, you know, uh, customize something maybe. And so it's just convenient to work with Git. Um, most source packages are not actually tracked in Git, we just import them from Jesse, and then we patch them uh, using the Debian patching system on a, on a neat basis. So that is a different workflow. Um, in any case, whenever you have a source package, then you want to build binaries uh, from, from binary packages from that source package. And that we do with OBS. So uh, OBS is a, is a project that I believe was uh, started by SUSE, but it's not SUSE specific at all. Um, it is, uh, I, I, don't, I don't really know if it has any, any equivalent, but it, it, it's kind of like a package repository. Then it has all these builders, and it can build the source package into binaries on many architectures. And it handles uh, dependency resolutions. It has backends for RPMs, for deb, uh, deb packages, and things like that. And uh, we have builders for three architectures right now, 32-bit, 64-bit uh, Intel, and uh, ARM v7, so that's the ARM 32-bit. And it works really well uh, for our use case. I, you know, if you happen to, it, it's kind of like Koji and Fedora, I guess. Uh, if you have a similar use case, I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a really a great, great tool. Um, 
it forces a very specific workflow, I would say, is the only like real limitation. So it doesn't use, uh, you know, Git or a real track, like not a, not, not a real, that's not fair, but it doesn't use like a common, um, uh, a standard, uh, you know, change tracking system, versioning system. So it's a little, it's a little uh, hard, the, the learning curve is a little hard with the tool. But once you get it, you can go pretty far with it. Um, okay, so you have all these binary packages now. We went from source, uh, we went from, you know, trees to source devs, from source devs to binary devs. Now we want to make an OS tree together uh, using those packages. We have uh, a tool that does that, um, which is basically, you can think, you can think of it, you, you take a meta package that defines all the things that you want, all the binary packages that you want in your OS. You feed it to a bootstrap system that resolves all this dependency chain and basically creates an exploded file system in, 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 almost like in a chroot, in a directory, right? Then you can take that, uh, that has all the binary data that you want, and you can take it to create an OS3 commit. So every time that you want to create a new OS3, let's say every night or you know on demand, however you have it configured, this process goes, takes all the binaries, creates a commit, pushes it to OS3. Uh, and that's basically it. Like OS3 does most of this, uh, most of the work of deduplicating the data for you. So if nothing changed, you're redeploying the same binaries when you commit it to OS3, OS3 will see, oh, nothing changed here. Great. Um, you know, the commit is only going to be the delta. Uh, the actual version of this tool that we have is not fully uh, open, mostly because of lack of time. We have uh, a snapshot that we took like a month ago or so, and it's on uh, this URL. Um, I will put my slides somewhere so that you can actually click it. Uh, so if you want to see it, I know that some people from Debian were interested in doing something similar. Um, they uh, they looked at it and you know they they, they gave us some feedback, so that that was uh, that was nice. Uh, and another thing about this this process is that it has some configurable hooks, so you can say, you know, after you've deployed these packages, run the scripts to move things around or to add some files before you actually commit it to OS3. So it's nice and flexible, and I think, you know, it's a tool that we would like uh, to um, to share with the community because I think maybe other people have the same uh, use case. And we also use it to build Flatpak runtimes because they're basically the same thing. They're just like a, a file system tree uh, composed from a meta package. Um, Flatpak apps, on the other hand, they're completely different. Uh, so uh, mostly the, 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 the thing that makes them special is that they have to be built with a particular uh, prefix. So uh, slash app, um, and that turns out not to be so uh, uh, trivial in a way because uh, many uh, uh, applications or Debian packages hard code slash user paths kind of everywhere. Um, so we have an OBS project that by default, instead of configuring things with slash, with slash user, configures things with slash app. So we create basically binary dev packages that put things in slash app and that, uh, you know, put all the um, linker flags and things like that with the uh, appropriate prefix. Um, and, and so we have uh, these packages in OBS, both for uh, the dependencies of the apps that are not included in the runtime and the top level apps themselves. Um, then there is a, a, another process uh, called Dev Flatpak Builder that takes and manifests a description of what all these packages are, a list of these packages, and um, kind of similar to Flatpak Builder itself, downloads the binaries that were built that way um, and uh, puts them in a directory, adds the app data information that's needed for GNOME software to display this application, um, and then calls back to the actual Flatpak build export and you know build update repo and things like that to generate the real uh, Flatpak bundle. So this is coordinated through another set of Jenkins jobs. It's run uh, kind of on demand. 
this is not a part of the infrastructure that I'm particularly proud about, uh, but it is how we made it work. Uh, it is possible to take Debian binary packages made just in the right way, put them together and create a flock pack out of it. It works in practice. Um, we, um, when we can, so for apps that we build in house that we use Git for ourselves, uh, we actually use the a real Flatpak builder. So, um, you know, we define a manifest, we give it to Flatpak builder, and uh, it, it basically, you know, it's, it, it's uh, controlled through a script, but it does most of the work for us, uh, exactly how it works upstream. This is by far my favorite way of creating bundles. Um, uh, however, there's something to be said that when you have a large number of apps that you need to maintain, the uh, possibility of, let's say, you know, a few of these apps will have one library that they all share. It's kind of appealing and it's kind of convenient to be able to build binaries for this particular library only once and have it there kind of as a recipe that then all the apps can go and take that. Um, so that, you know, this is a, a lot more of a streamlined workflow, but it has some, um, some limitations as well. Um, and currently, we only use this for no arc, no arch applications. So for things that you know don't don't compile actual code, uh, mostly because we don't have an ARM uh, node on uh, the Jenkins builder. Um, so uh, what else? So we have all these OS trees. Some of these are for runtime. Some of these are for uh, the OS itself. Some of these are for apps. Um, we need something that puts it all together. That is the image builder. So it takes all these branches and repos that we have built, composes them into a single file system tree. Um, again, this is engineered so that it has a few stages. Um, you know, like you go and grab all the trees, then you put them on the file system, and uh, then you need to install the bootloader, then you need to do like a bunch of things. Um, and uh, at every step of this process, you can actually uh, add your own customizations. So it's kind of a powerful tool. I really hope, uh, like, again, it's still uh, behind closed doors, unfortunately, today mostly for lack of time. It also has some, like, private keys or stuff like that, but, that we, you know, we could uh, easily remove that. Uh, this is something we really hope to share with the community really soon. Um, another nice thing that it does is that it does image time configuration. So for instance, it can create a deconf database with some hard-coded settings or some uh, default settings that you may want to see. Uh, so that's kind of a useful thing to have. Um, uh, I want to spend a couple of words on codec management. Uh, I wish that uh, Mario, who is the person that worked on this, was here, but he isn't. Uh, we actually ship the, the codecs, we ship them inside OS3, inside the core OS itself. They are encrypted, however. So if you don't have a key to decrypt them, they're just a binary blob with, with, with no use, right? Um, so. Uh, the idea, this is kind of an idea loosely borrowed from Raspberry Pi, is that you have these binaries that are, you know, locked until you actually have an activation key that you can obtain or purchase or, or get. Once you have it, there is a system service uh, that will detect that you have this key and that will decrypt the files and put the decrypted version in a location that the operating system uh, components like GStreamer, for instance, can find. Um, so when you buy an endless computer on our website, it comes with a, a bunch of these activation keys already in it. Um, and um, what we intend to do is we intend to add, uh, you know, the possibility for someone to buy more on GNOME software itself. So you will be able to buy an activation key for a new codec that we that we ship in the OS. Um, I don't know. I it, think it, it's kind of like a, a different way of um, of doing codec management than what you would find in a in a traditional Linux distro. Uh, I want to breeze through uh, a bunch of these things because I know that I don't have a lot of time. Uh, um, there, you know, we 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 were kind of like one of our early users of Flatpak. Uh, so we found a lot of things that could be improved in there, or you know, by putting it in production, uh, we found some uh, some missing features basically. And, and here, uh, I want to talk about a few of them. 
some of these I talked to Alex already, actually, but uh, stable branch management, currently there's no real good way to uh, say that for this particular repository of applications, the branch name foo is the stable one, is the default one. So GNOME software, if there are multiple branches in a repo, and maybe you know there's a nightly branch and a stable branch, and both ha uh, they have the same application, just the two different versions, GNOME software by default would just show the application twice, um, which is clearly not what we want. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think we, we have a way forward with Alex. We talked about this. Um, and you know there will be a way for a repository through an attribute of the repository itself to say this is my stable branch, this is my default branch, pull from here. Um, upstream branch management is also uh, a little suboptimal right now. Uh, there's one big uh, file basically that contains information for all the branches. However, if you have this nice separation between stable and and, and nightly, uh, you could also ideally you, you would want separate upstream branches for uh, each of those. Um, so uh, what else? Um, uh, this is actually something yeah, uh, that hasn't been brought up so far. Um, dependency resolution is something that is very intentionally outside of Flatpak. Uh, so applications can just say, I want runtime x, y, and that's fine. Uh, but what if um, the runtime version x, y depends on a service s that is only available in the OS version a, b? So and this is a little bit mathematical here. But the problem is that if I update uh, the runtime without first upgrading the OS, the application won't work uh, because the OS will not have that service. Uh, and the update client has no way of knowing that. I don't think that introducing a concept of OS version dependency in the app it's like in the app bundle is a good idea because every OS does versioning in a different way. I, I, I just you know it, it looks like a can of worms. Uh, however, we could depend instead on the service being available. So if the service has a Dbus interface, you can say in the app, I want this Dbus interface to be available on the OS, and then uh, you know the update client can actually detect a runtime that the Dbus interface is present in the operating system before even you know, offering that as a possible update or a possible application that you can install. Um, this doesn't exist, so it's just an idea. It's kind of an open problem. Uh, we are lucky right now that, you know, this hasn't really happened yet in practice because we only have one version of everything because we're just launching it. So <laughs> we'll need to fix it for the next version. And, uh, uh, you know, if you're interested in this topic, participate in the flat pack uh, buff on Monday. Um, what else? Um, deltas are really, really nice. This is a native feature of OS3 that Flatpak uses. Uh, when you go between two versions, you don't download the whole new application again. You just download the differences, and then you apply them. Uh, it's a little uh, uh, hard to understand what those differences are. So it would be nice to have some analysis tools for deltas, uh, perhaps something that you can see on the server side what the delta was when it was generated. Perhaps some of these things exist. It's it's kind of like you know a, an evolving um, an evolving feature. So you know something we can improve or we can work on there for sure. Um, and you know the space savings and bandwidth savings of deltas are really relevant for us. Um, um, another uh, thing that we had to face is uh, sometimes there are some I call it runtime services bundles. There are some things that you want that are not applications. They shouldn't be part of the OS. There should, they can be part of the runtime, but they're tied to the runtime. The main problem is that runtimes cannot export things like debug services. So, uh, for instance, if you like one use case that we had, um, endless apps depend on uh, a single search provider process. They all share the same underlying technology. So, um, basically, we had to create a fake app that just exports the search provider to avoid putting the uh, library that the application depends on in the core OS. Um, I don't know if that's the proper way to do it. I'll, I'll be open to suggestions on this. Uh, it works in practice. Uh, 
it would be nice to have you know kind of the concept of play services right like the, the, the google play store uh you can uh okay you can download it separately um from the os kind of as as an add-on and you can update it independently so um uh, i'm out of time i just want to mention a few things uh oh boy uh uh, there was a lot here. Uh, <laughs> I just want to mention a few things. Uh, we have a, a few bits that are not fully upstream yet. Um, some of these are uh, patches that we posted, like underscan. If there is a modern maintainer in the room, please review the underscan patches. They're really, really nice. They are on Bugzilla. Uh, we have a password reminder feature. Um, we want to integrate it uh, in GNOME Control Center now that account service has been uh, released with the feature that we wanted. Um, we have some really nice ideas about how you launch an application and the splash screen that uh, you get. Currently, like in GNOME, you just get a spinning cursor while the application is launching, and that was not enough for our users to realize that the application was launching and that nothing that that it wasn't that nothing was happening. So they were like just clicking the same icon, like why is it not launching? Why is it not launching? Because they weren't noticing the spinning cursor. So now we put a big full screen spinner like uh, uh, iOS does, basically. Um, Maybe that's something that we want as well. No, I don't know. Um, we have this thing that's really nice. It's called, it's, it's a tiny, tiny thing. It's called gates. And uh, the reason that it's called gates is because you want to open a Windows binary. Right now, if you download a Windows binary, nothing happens. It's like you get like a really weird error message. Instead, this is some, you know, you get something a little better. It just says, oh, you know, you downloaded the binary. That's not for your. Uh, operating system, and maybe you want to check X and Y. So definitely an area where we could be more helpful in GNOME itself. Um, yeah, there would be a lot more, but I am out of time. So I don't know if we have time for a couple of questions. <laughs> Do we? Do you guys have questions? I am, yes, yes, I'm running it on the laptop. <laughs> yes? You're saying the users don't have access to the, they don't see the packages and everything, but could they? Like, I mean, if you, if you want it to do that, like, with uh, password or whatever. Yes, there is a command that is, EOS break my system, basically. <laughs> EOS break the OS tree uh, that um, uh, turns the system back into a regular Debian distro, and then you can do sudo up get update and things like that. But you know, we we don't tell anyone, so please don't 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 go write this. <laughs> no. Anyone else? Yes. Do you know of any comparable projects or anybody with similar games to this? Because this is very radical. I haven't heard of anything quite like this before. Um. I don't actually. No, I mean the, the way that it's put together, I I, I don't know. Uh, I think Atomic maybe uh, there's some similarities there with Project Atomic, their use of OS3, uh, but it's clearly a very different use case. So Atomic is more, uh, yeah, like in the cloud camp, I guess. Uh. Okay, yeah, the Atomic Workstation effort, but it's also based, still based on RPM, as far as I, RPM, RPM OS3, yeah, so you can install packages, but it's a little different. Oh, okay, yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not familiar with the, with the details, so. Okay, yeah, so go to uh, Alberto's talk, or Owen's talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Thank you very much then. Thank you.